Welcome to our special series of Let's Talk for KubeCode EU, and I'm your host, Sopdil Bhartia. My next guest is Julian Fisher, CEO and founder of any 9 And today we are going to talk about the future of Cloud Foundry on Kubernetes. Julian, it's great to have you back on the show. It's great to be back. Thank you. I wish we could have done that in person as we have done in previous Cube calls, but well, we have to do when uh, lemon, lemonade, that's the story right now. Uh, I want to talk to you about uh, what discussions are you hearing when it's come to uh, Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes. There have been two major projects uh, pushing Cloud Foundry into the direction of Kubernetes, which was uh, kubectl and um, uh, CF for uh, Kubernetes. Um, I think um, kubectl is uh, has become less popular, with uh, CF for Kubernetes being the well, let's say candidate to uh, move forward. So that that would have been my assessment um, in case you asked me a few a few months back. But um, now it seems to be that the impact of Kubernetes uh, to Cloud Foundry is more substantial, and that uh, the Cloud Foundry Foundation and its members, where also Anynimes is uh, is a member, uh, the discussions they are heading into a new direction. In particular, uh, the idea is that if there are components um, necessary to, uh, to offer an application developer experience on Kubernetes that evolve quickly and have wide adoption in the Kubernetes uh, ecosystem. So we're talking about functionality such as um, service meshes uh, and ingresses, for example. Then the question is whether there is value um, if, if Cloud Foundry basically also has the same functionality. So it appears that the direction Cloud Foundry is moving to is to adapt more of the Kubernetes uh, components that have, let's say, conquered certain niches in the, um, in the, Cloud Found in the Kubernetes ecosystem and therefore adapt those Kubernetes native technologies uh, more, uh, reducing the amount of code that Cloud Foundry itself has to um, uh, govern. And I think that will lead to um, two effects. First, the Cloud Foundry experience will uh, become closer to a native Kubernetes experience in the sense that, for example, um, more Kubernetes uh, idioms will also be supported by Cloud Foundry, and that Cloud Foundry itself becomes more lean, and uh, I think also infrastructure uh, over it will be reduced a bit. At the same time, it's also the case that um, Kubernetes and Cloud Foundry, they do have this uh, special relationship, so to say. So I think where Cloud Foundry will remain strong is in the overall experience of having a full, let's say this popular or the, the famous CF push experience. So the CF push experience will be preserved. And I also think that the idea of having Cloud Foundry for um, clusters, Kubernetes clusters, where there are a lot of applications that have to be maintained in a production grade manner, that also will be a strong focus in Cloud Foundry. So in contrast to other projects where there's more focus on getting it started and uh, you know, have that pleasant, that pleasant experience, uh, Cloud Foundry was always a bit more heavyweight, but at the same time robust and suitable for large scale applications. Um, so I think that will be uh, preserved doing the migration towards Kubernetes. Can you talk about uh, what kind of challenges that you have seen companies do face when they do move from CF environments to CF for Kubernetes? Well, honestly, I think most of the Cloud Foundry users, I mean, I'm talking about companies who have invested into Cloud Foundry a while ago, let's say a few years back, um, I don't think that many of these companies are already or have already migrated towards uh, a Kubernetes-based stack because especially if these environments are large and there are many hundreds or thousands of applications, 
I don't think it's the time yet to, to do that and perform that migration. I think where the, most of the organizations are is in, in observing what happens to Cloud Foundry, how it is integrated with Kubernetes and what the implications are for migration. So I can basically summarize what are the discussions about migration. Um, well, I think as long as they're a Cloud Foundry uh, interface, uh, migrating Cloud Foundry workloads from one Cloud Foundry to another Cloud Foundry instance is something that, well, let's say it's, it's well understood. Uh, so we as a company have done that several times when customers move from a commercial Cloud Foundry offering to our any ninth platform, for example. So I think that's a problem that's well understood. And I think the migration path from Cloud Foundry towards anything that will be more uh, integrated with Kubernetes um, will also support such a path. There might be more restrictions than seen in, in, in previous um, um, changes to Cloud Foundry. Um, for example, when moving from, uh, from Diego, uh, for, from DEA to Diego, um, now that migration that's upcoming might be a bit more impactful because um, moving to Kubernetes technologies may lead to some restrictions. Otherwise, well, let's say the teams working on Cloud Foundry, they'll have to uh, make a trade-off decision between uh, the effort to implement a compatibility and at the same time, you know, be open to new changes and adapt a Cloud Foundry, uh, Kubernetes technology. So I, I, I think for most users, Migrations will be fine on the application side. So applications running on Cloud Foundry, you can push them to a Kubernetes and migration best practices that are already well understood and to some degree also documented, they can be applied. However, Cloud Foundry always uh, has, has drawn a line in the sand and, uh, and divided uh, an application platforms into the application runtime and anything that provides state. So in the original 12-factor manifest, they were called backing services. Uh, another term would be data services, including databases, message queues, and so on. So what about them? I, I don't think that Cloud Foundry will provide a migration path for anything like that because it's basically not in the scope of Cloud Foundry, never has been. Well, let's say most of the time it has not been in the focus of Cloud Foundry. Um, so I think that that's where a lot of the challenges will be. It's like, how do you migrate your databases along with your applications? So you did mention, you know, uh, that what all you can or cannot easily migrate, of course, apps are there, but of course, data services, and which is even more critical than app itself. Uh, talk about the pitfalls uh, when migrating data services and uh, what are the right ways to migrate them? Well, the challenges of migrating uh, data services, uh, data service instances from one Cloud Foundry to another um, is it, it, it really depends on, on the circumstances and the context. So for example, it's different when all you want to exchange is the Cloud Foundry runtime. Let's say you want to uh, reduce the Bosch-based environment in favor to the Kubernetes-based environment. So if your data services still you know, sit somewhere and you can still refer to them, well, then you may even have no urge to migrate your data service instances. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, our data service um, product called any Nines Data Services is a, is a set of different service brokers with uh, lifecycle automation. So they basically deploy uh, virtual machines uh, triggered are triggering or triggered by uh, Bosch. So our service broker talks to Bosch, Bosch creates virtual machines. And um, we recommended all our any Nines platform customers to have the data service uh, installation in, a, in an isolated network segment and not to use, uh, for example, if possible, uh, our PCF tiles, but instead use uh, Bosch to deploy our automation and also keep it in a, in a separate network segment. Because this way, you can basically just add another Cloud Foundry instance and refer to the same uh, service brokers and, uh, and therefore migrate service instances from one 
uh, Cloud Foundry instance to another. I mean, still there's some work to be done, for example, integrating or uh, importing metadata of those service instances, but you actually, you will have the service instance available. Now it's a different, um, a different scenario uh, when the goal is to really get rid of, of virtual machines altogether and move to a pure Kubernetes native container-based um, platform. So for, for this, um, we, will, we are also offering, um, and these products are upcoming, Postgres being the first one, we're going to um, add um, operators uh, under the same license uh, as the any 9 data services. So customers will be able to create service instances natively on Kubernetes as well. Um, and if, if then um, the challenge is a bit different because then you have to migrate the service instances. You basically have to do a, either a replication-based or a backup restore-based migration path. Now, with our data service, the advantage will be that backup and restore interfaces will be compatible so that you can basically bulk export and bulk import service instances. Now, with the absence of such a um, automation that will spend multiple data services, the problem may be more complex because for each data service, you'll have to create your own migration path to get from virtual machines into a container-based solution. So if you have 10 different products doing data service automation, you'll have to talk to 10 different vendors or find 10 different migration paths somewhere else. And that's, I think, um, where a lot of work will um, cause a lot of effort. CI CD is becoming a very critical piece where you are just pushing a lot of things for security perspective is also important. What are the limitations of CF push when you are looking at Kubernetes and how is the Cloud Foundry or you know, CF for Kubernetes is trying to address that? Well, I think the trend is that uh, whatever is an entity in Cloud Foundry today, will the attempt will be to reflect this entity in Kubernetes with the Kubernetes uh, idiomatic uh, format. So for example, uh, anything that's an API object in Cloud Foundry, it may become a custom resource in Kubernetes. So I think there will be a, um, um, a, con a convergence between Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes and uh, the difference or the gap between the two technologies will become less and less. So the user experience um, is still one of the strong suits of Cloud Foundry. However, other projects from the Kubernetes ecosystem, such as, for example, uh, KPAC and, and the alikes, they seem to be widely adopted and may become the future standard. So the CF user experience will be preserved, but one of the goals will be to make it more declarative because that's basically a leading paradigm in the Kubernetes ecosystem. So, the challenge is not only to make those customers happy who are using Cloud Foundry today. So we have to separate the discussion a bit between those who are already invested into Cloud Foundry and Cloud Foundry as a technology that has to survive in the tech ecosystem uh, in the sense that it needs to drive adoption. So uh, I think the Cloud Foundry Foundation sees the challenge that they'll have to position Cloud Foundry in a way that uh, new engineers from, let's say, the Kubernetes ecosystem will also look into Cloud Foundry. And for those users, uh, the requirements of the user experience will have to be uh, more idiomatic towards uh, Kubernetes than uh, the more um, imperative approach that came along with uh, CF command line utility. So I think that will be exciting to see, to see a shift over time towards, towards that um, more Kubernetes-like declarative approach. We have, of course, as usual, we have this discussion earlier also that the whole landscape is evolving and any nice platform is also evolving. Talk about how the platform is evolving kind of in sync with the changes that you see within the ecosystem and the market itself platform owner has to modify and has to upgrade, has to change and, and make the platform evolve. And, and so do we. So um, I think we mentioned that in earlier conversations, but one of the thoughts that Cloud Foundry came along with was 
it could, can be the dominant platform within an organization. So the one and only thing will be Cloud Foundry. So if you put all your applications on Cloud Foundry, then the Cloud Foundry marketplace, for example, which is a very, very enriching feature for a platform, offering standardized data services for, for, for easy consumption. Um, so the marketplace idea also was a little bit influenced by the fact that Cloud Foundry tried to be the dominant platform. Now I think it's clear that Cloud Foundry is not necessarily in all organizations the dominant platform because some local development teams will require more flexibility where Kubernetes has advantages. So if, if you take that into consideration, then you'll have to break up a platform into smaller modules. And that's what we do with the N9 platform as well. So a few years back, if you asked the, uh, us to build you an application developer platform, we would provide you with the Cloud Foundry, data service automation, and all the monitoring tools and CI, CD automation. It's necessary to make that efficient. Now, today, if we talk to clients, we'll ask them to tell, them, to tell us about their requirements. What are the different groups of developers? Um, and what are their particular requirements? And then we find out what kind of platform stack is right for them. If they, for example, have a lot of 12-factor compliant applications and, and they want to do uh, a effortless operation, then Cloud Foundry is suitable for them. And especially if they want to have easy access to data services, you know, consuming data services based on well-tested service plans rather than uh, have, having to fiddle around with, uh, uh, you know, object specs that are more complicated. However, if there are developers who have um, very specific needs and also demand for components from the Kubernetes ecosystem, then providing them with a standardized Cloud Foundry wouldn't be a good choice. So by making all the modules of the N9 platform optional is the first step where you can take a Cloud Foundry, you can take an on-demand Kubernetes, you can take the N9 data services on Bosch or on uh, on Kubernetes, and you can combine these modules in an arbitrary fashion. Now, the next step will be that we'll also uh, think about Kubernetes modules. We'll call them Kubernetes extensions. That will include service meshes, um, that will include popular uh, frameworks, including workflow managers, uh, CI, CD tooling, Cloud Foundry itself, uh, things like Knative, so that you can then take those Kubernetes extensions, which will uh, be automated throughout their life cycle, similar to what we do with data service today. And then you can form your own templates for a Kubernetes stack, um, let's say a, a Knative stack for one developer group and a Cloud Foundry stack for another. So you'd be able to have those stack templates and, uh, in, and instantiate clusters um, easily, and you will also be able to guide them through their life cycle, including things like monitoring, backup, and restore. So the, the ecosystem is more modularized than Kubernetes, so will be the N9 platform. Uh, Julian, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about uh, the evolution of the platform and all the challenges that organizations are facing when they're moving uh, their workloads from uh, Cloud Foundry environment to Cloud Foundry for uh, CF for uh, Kubernetes. And I look forward to talk to you again. Thank you. Uh, you're very welcome. And, uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, pleasure to talk to you again. See you soon.